Good evening. Welcome back to Ambassador Baptist Church. Those of you that are watching live by Facebook, we welcome you into our lovely auditorium where everyone is everywhere. Amen. Had a good morning this morning. Our attendance was up. Had a couple of visitors. And uh, for the first time in a long time, ran out of bulletins. And she even made more than she normally makes. So praise the Lord. Amen. Or you know, we'll be running a hundred, and the building will be full, and the chairs will all be back together, and there will be no thing as COVID, and we'll be having fellowships, and yeah. all right, can't wait for that either. But we're we're going to see how it goes for a couple more weeks, and then we're going to step out by faith as safely as we can. Amen. Let's go, to the Lord, in prayer. Our Father, we are grateful for this great day and for your love for us. For this season where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. I pray that you will meet with us tonight, that your Holy Spirit would move, touch our hearts, and fill us with your Holy Spirit, lead, guide, and direct us through the message. Thank you that Brother Kim is doing better. pray that you continue to be with him, to give him a good week of therapy this week, and that he can get his strength back and get back home with Miss Carolyn as soon as possible. And just pray for others, Lord, that cannot be here with us, those that are traveling, others that are dealing with uh, other areas of their life, just pray that you'll meet their needs according to your will. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Y'all find number 334. Blessed assurance, 334. <laughs> teach the children this and teach the children that. And I said, sir, how can you teach those what you murdered or supported murdering, <laughs> taking out and killing? And uh, I'm getting brave in my old age. What do I have to lose? What do we have to lose? Greater is he that is in us than that he's in the world. And how can you teach the children if you abort them? 
I mean, who knows out of the 50, 60 million kids since Roe v. Wade uh, could be scientists or doctors or what have you these days, or preachers or preachers' wives or missionaries or whatever. Yeah. Of course, most of them that are aborted aren't. Anyway, we just need to take a stand for what's right, amen? Yeah. It's going to get tougher as the days go by. But you look at Paul and Peter and all those guys in the Bible, they were put in prison and they were, uh, you know, persecuted. God said we'd suffer persecution. And so he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and nothing has changed in this book. Amen. So I'm just getting brave in my old age. If I'd have started when I was younger, I might be brave. But I'm going to do my best, and we all need to, Amen. amen. All right, don't forget now, next Sunday evening, we will observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, have a short service about the Lord's Supper, then observe the Lord's Supper. And we'll have everything uh, safe and so that everything can be done right. And, of course, Miss Judy's birthday tomorrow. We can't forget that. And uh, so, you know, if you haven't said happy birthday to her yet, say happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> and then, of course, the six, we've got two other special ladies that have birthdays. And so... Good, amen. Yeah. Every year we can celebrate a birthday is good. Yes, it is. I'm looking for my first year in heaven birthday. <laughs> I'm ready for that too as well, amen. amen. All right, turn tonight at Luke chapter number 14. Last week we kind of started talking about uh, being a follower or being a fan. And we looked at Luke chapter 9 verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And so tonight we're kind of going to continue on that thought, only we're going to get a little deeper. Good to get a little deeper in the Word of God, amen? Mm -hmm. But the concept, any man, or even anyone, is a, a frequently used concept in the Bible, or whosoever. And, it, and even though it may say any man, for instance, this verse says if any man will come after me, it's referring to mankind, it's referring to you ladies, it's referring to children, it's referring to all of us, if we will come. Uh, but it's the word that is used, and it's obvious that Jesus came to die for everyone, not just any man, but for everyone, uh, to provide salvation, to provide eternity uh, for us. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, okay, if any man comes and accepts me, they're going to heaven and leave out the women. Because the Bible says, whosoever. And whosoever covers everyone, does it not? But... Anyone, everyone, whosoever, those words that the Bible uses refers to all of us. And so in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27, we're going to look tonight, uh, the Lord kind of turns up the heat. And so when we read these verses, then the question that kind of looms over us is, am I a fan of Jesus or am I a follower of Jesus? And so verse number 25, it says, and there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Now the great multitudes are there, yes, but they're not there for the right reasons. Uh, the great multitudes are there to see a show. Uh, they want to see him heal somebody. They want to see him raise somebody from the dead. Mm -hmm. They want to see him feed the crowds. They want to see him hug the babies. And all the things that Jesus did. And so here is kind of like the fans have all showed up. Now here it, there's some followers in there as we will look and see as we study. But look what he says. He said unto them, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's getting a little more strict than just any man. Amen? Look at the next verse. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. And so uh, every time that these groups come to the Lord and they're coming in there, whether it's after a miracle, whether it's after the feeding, Jesus ups the bar a little bit. Jesus ups the commitment a little bit. In chapter 9, it was, if any man will come after me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now he's talking about following him to the point that you, you love him and follow him so close that it looks like you hate everybody else. He's not telling us to hate our family. He's not telling us to hate people like, Miss Judy, I just hate you. <laughs> He's telling us that our love for him, our following of him, ought to be so great that it appears like our brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers are just second-class people. Yeah. That's how that is interpreted. And if we're going to follow him, 
then that's what we're going to have to do. And so I'm going to give you four things tonight as we look at this and try to bring to realism exactly what Jesus is trying to bring to this crowd, to get them to understand, uh, because he does it for all of us. Uh, he wants us to become followers. But, that three-letter word, if we're going to become followers, there's a price to be paid. The question is, one, do you want to be a follower? And two, if you do, are you willing to pay the price? And so the first thing you have is the call. I left a blank, so you have to write tonight. The call. Both of these passages are issuing a call uh, to you and I or to whoever it is. Uh, in the English language, the word is any man. Uh, as I've already stated, it's all of us. The, the call goes out to everyone. Every one of you tonight. If you want to be a follower, there's some things that he's calling you to do. If you want to be a fan, uh, there's some things that you don't need to do. Um, but the call is to followers. It's to disciples. It's to you and I. Those of us that are saved. Those of us that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're the disciples. It's not for the spiritual elite. It's for everyone. Did he not say, if any man? It's everyone. It's not just this certain group over here that thinks they've arrived, or this group over here. It's for all of us. Jesus is putting the call out to everyone and giving everyone an opportunity to respond to his voice. See, we have, we have the choice to respond or not. We have the choice to just be a fan or to be a follower. But we need to understand uh, that if we're going to be followers, there's a price to pay. The call is not just to be forgiven for our sins and to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior so that we can go to heaven. That's the minimum. You remember the verse that says, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service? That's just the minimum. And the minimum here is, is that we get saved and we're on our way to heaven. But that's just the minimum. That's not where Christ wants us to stop. That's why he says that if we're going to be followers, we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross, and we have to follow him. So there's a call for all of us. You notice the, the verbiage in chapter 14. It says, if any man comes to me. So you can either come to him, or you can go away from him. It's a two-way street, amen? It says, those that come to me. Now remember, at this point, he's speaking to this large crowd. This, this big group, this Sunday morning crowd. The Sunday morning crowd that comes at their leisure or that maybe comes at their convenience. There may have been some this morning that came but didn't really want to come. Maybe they wanted to do something else. My wife and I coming home from lunch today went past the soccer field. Unbelievable. Yeah. Couldn't find a parking spot. I mean, it was packed. Come around the corner, come down by the YMCA ball fields. Packed to the max. People got their priorities. People got what they want to do. Sunday mornings, we go past the ball field. The kids are out there playing. We go the other way. We go past the golf course. Guys are out there playing. They're setting their priorities. They're fans, not followers. Or maybe not even fans. But this, uh, he says, come to me. Now, when you got saved, where did you come to? You had to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You had to come to him for your salvation. And there are people who think that they can come to the Lord, they can meet him on their own terms, and that God's this genie in a bottle, and they can just get what they want. I'm afraid it don't work that way. Amen? Amen? God makes it very clear in his word. Now, in chapter 9, he's speaking to the 12. He's letting the 12 know, if any man will follow me, and it was to everyone, but, it, but he was speaking to the 12. Now here he's speaking to the crowd. In chapter 14, he's speaking to everyone. If any man will come after me. And so while there's that subtle change from just the 12 and focusing on them to the crowd, here's the thing. He's keeping the bar of commitment up there. First it was the 12, kind of, you guys, you know, you need to set an example. Then he's talking to the crowd, and it's a little higher. Not just come after me and pick up your cross and deny yourself. Now it's got to look like you hate your family and you hate everything else. And so it's, it's raising the bar. You and I, when we got saved, we were babes. 
But those of us that have been saved any length of time, the bar ought to be raised. We shouldn't still be babies. We ought to be up there studying the word, reading the word, praying, witnessing, doing the things, coming to church, giving all the things that, that commitment should be when you get saved. Amen? And raising the bar. So there's the call. If any man, that's all inclusive. Matter of fact, in chapter 9, he said it to all, did he not? But secondly, notice the cost. First there's the call, then there's the cost. Now, let me offer you my personal belief. Uh, if this is truth, and I believe it is because the word of God is truth, is it not? Yeah. Uh, there's going to be struggles. I think that's the church today. I think that's why the church today is struggling. There are a lot of folks in the church today that are just fans. They don't come for God to speak to them. They don't. They come, a lot of churches, they come for the entertainment. And I don't mean me. I'm talking about the music and the, the different things that churches have. And I was talking to my wife this morning on the way in about, should we start up coffee and donuts again? Or should we not? Is that just, you know, is that just entertainment? Is that just to get them here? Because we've made it for over a year without it. We're doing just good, amen? Mm -hmm. And saving a lot of money. But, but people come for the entertainment, do they not? And I think that's the problem with the church. In 2 Samuel 24, when David sinned against God by counting the military, that God told him not to, then God punished David by sending a plague on the men. If you've read your Bible, you know the story. Well, then David came to Arana to buy his threshing floor to build an altar to God. And I hate those names, but Arana, A-R-A-U-N-A-N-A, him offered it to him at no charge. But the king wouldn't do that. The king said, 2 Samuel 24, 24, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. And so it's going to cost us something if we're going to surrender to the Lord. It's going to cost us something. It may cost us our families. It may cost us uh, our jobs. It may cost, who knows what it may cost. We have to decide if we're going to be a follower, if we're going to deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow the Lord, or if we're just going to be a fan and if it fits in my schedule, that's fine. If not, uh, but I think that's some of the flaws that we have in the churches today. There are a lot of folks there. Uh, they're content to offer God that which costs them nothing. Yeah, I'll get up for a half hour, an hour on Sunday morning and go and get it done. Preacher won't call me and wonder why I wasn't there, and this, that, and the other. And they'll sacrifice an hour, but they're just coming for show, like this crowd. Just coming to see what they can see, see what's going to happen, see what's going to take place. Maybe there's a meal after the service, and they're coming to get through that hour so they can eat the meal. And believe it or not, there are those that are like that. But I think Jesus makes it clear that that's not enough. It's not enough just to be saved on your way to heaven. And there are a lot of people today that are like that in churches. They got saved, they're on their way to heaven. And so if they come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, so be it. If they come Sunday morning only, so be it. If they come once a month, so be it. They're doing it on their terms. Those are fans. Those aren't followers. They're not willing to pay the cost. They're not willing to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow the Lord. Uh, they just want to do it at their own terms. In verse 26... He says, if any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Chapter 9, it said, deny ourselves. That's our own life. Now he's saying, not only deny yourself, but you've got to love me to the point that it seems like you don't love your family. In other words, he should come first. There's a cost to that, is there not? Now, first of all, I didn't say it. Jesus did. So don't say, well, preacher, you just think you're... No, Jesus is the one that said it. I gave it to you straight out of his word, amen? And secondly, we need to understand the, the teaching in the context because people will come and send me an email or call me or make a comment and say, hate is not hate. Hate is hate. It just, it's not, Jesus is not going to tell us to love one another and then tell us to hate all those people. Yeah. Jesus says that our love for him ought to be of such that it looks like everyone else is hated. And it's not just people, it's our jobs. And so to, to be his disciple, 
We need to love Him so deep, so real, so complete, that we choose Him over everyone else every time. No question, it's Him. Not family members, not our bosses, not anything else. When it comes to choices, when it comes to decisions, we choose Him every time. We go to Him before we go to her and say, Honey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because honeys will lead us astray. And so our, our love for him must be so real, it must be so deep, it must be so sure that it looks like we don't care about anyone else. That There's a cost to that. But that's what Jesus says, is it not? Yeah. One pastor tells the story of a young woman that came to him on Sunday saying that she wanted to be baptized. And the preacher was excited, said, we'll look forward to having that baptism someday. She said, no, you don't understand, I want to be baptized now. The pastor said, okay, let's go. They went back to the changing room, got all changed, got up there uh, to the water, and the pastor looked at her and said, uh, your family and friends, ain't one here to support you for your baptism? And she said, my family will not be happy about my decision for Christ. And she drug him down to the baptism. <laughs> She knew the cost. She knew the sacrifice. But she was going to do what God wanted her to do. She was going to follow the Lord in baptism and take the step and be committed to Him. There are many people, maybe some of you that have gotten saved and, and sold out to the Lord, and you family member don't want nothing to do with you. Uh, when my dad and I got saved, my dad was an iron worker. A lot of those guys, he wouldn't go drink and smoke and cuss and rant and rave anymore, and he lost a lot of friends. But he really didn't lose a lot of friends. Over the course of time, through that, many of those guys got saved and are saved in heaven today. Because he was willing to take a commitment, take a stand, become a follower, not a fan. And that's where we need to be. And so, over my lifetime, I can't tell you how many times I've seen families split up because a husband or a spouse or someone got saved and started going to church. I was in the bus ministry for many, many years. Kids coming to church, parents getting angry. And vice versa, and, and you just got to be patient and got to put the Lord first. And a lot of the parents ended up coming and hearing and getting saved. And, and Miss Carolyn, they were in the bus ministry. Those of you that have been, you know what I'm talking about. But we need to, we need to make up our minds that we're going to do it. There's a cost. The question is, are you willing to pay the cost? And so, you know, there's been kids who said they felt like the Lord wanted them to do this. One young man said that God had called him to preach. His mother said, I don't think so. Well, yeah, the mother doesn't know. God called him to preach, he needs to go down that route. But the mother said, I don't think so. Whether he went on to preach or not, I don't know. Because I think a lot of times parents keep kids from doing perhaps what God would want them to do. I could have gone on and played baseball and been a pitcher and what have you, but God wanted me to go to Bible college. So I went to Bible college. My dad was happy. My mom, they had been divorced. She didn't probably really care. When she come to hear me preach, she probably wishes I went and played baseball because she had to hear the gospel, amen? But there are decisions that have to be made. And the young man wanted to do what God called him to do. Verse 26 says, if you don't love me more than these, you cannot be my disciple. So I ask you today. Now a fan would come to Jesus. Now listen, this is a fan. A fan would come to Jesus as long as it doesn't conflict with his schedule. Right. It'll make some folks mad now. <laughs> doesn't conflict with his family. Mm -hmm. Doesn't conflict with... You can put anything in there, job, money, whatever you want to put in there. A fan will be a, a fan for Jesus until something comes up. And we have all those, do we not? Another preacher told the story uh, at his Baptist church. They received an email from a man, and the man said that he wanted to cancel his membership from the church. He wanted to be taken completely off the rolls. Well, the pastor felt like that there was something there that needed to be examined a little deeper. So he called the man, and I don't know what it is, 58 or whatever, you can punch star and, so they can't see the caller ID. But he did that so that he, the man couldn't see the caller ID that it was him calling. So the man answered the phone, 
And uh, he said, I understand that you want to have your membership taken away from the church. And he said, well, yes, sir, I would like that. And so the preacher kind of wanted to know, I don't understand why you want to leave the church. He said, well, preacher, it's like this. I don't like your preaching. <laughs> now, I've heard that before. All preachers have, amen. But he said, I just don't like your preaching. And so the pastor said, well, you know, what's, what's up? He said, well, preacher, here it is. When I listen to your messages, I feel like you're trying to interfere with my life. <laughs> <laughs> you come to church and the pastor preaches this book, it's going to interfere with your life. Yep. But it ain't the pastor doing the interfering. It's the message that God gave the pastor to give to you that's doing the interfering. And so it's better just to get right with God than it is to give up and quit, amen? But this ought to interfere with our lives, especially if we're not living right, especially if we're not followers, if we're trying to be fans. It ought to interfere. It ought to step on our toes. It ought to do all those things. And so every authentic word of God that comes from God ought to get to you. Ought to speak to you. Uh, now the fan, they just simply dismiss it. It was in this here and out this here, out the door they go off to wherever they're going. But the follower will respond. Usually you'll see them at the, at the altar or you'll see them at their seat praying or what have you. Because they want to pay the cost. They want to be what God wants them to be. That comes to the third thing and that is the competition. The Bible still says there's a, a, a deal that goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I call him a deal because he's just a devil. A deal, amen? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Jesus says he wants to be first. He is a jealous God. He will have no other gods before him. But there's a lot of competition out there, is there not? There's a lot of things that we, even as Christians, uh, have our allegiance and our love and our commitment to. He demands that we be committed to him and him alone. And so in Luke 14, no one, father, mother, brethren, sisters, sons, daughters, no one is to come close to our commitment for him. He ought to be right here, everybody else down here somewhere. And when we get this part right, all this down here will fall into place. Exactly as God's commanded it to be. Amen? It's all about putting him first. Uh, how would you feel? I'm not going to call anybody by name because you get upset. But how would you feel if your mate was carrying your picture in their wallet? You'd love it, wouldn't you? Showing you off. But right behind it was the last three boyfriends or girlfriends' pictures. So that when they pull them out, they look at you and say, Wouldn't like that, would we? Wouldn't want that to take place, would we? Say, I love you, but oh, you remember, man, back in the day and back in the day, and I know nobody here does that, but there are those. I'm just using it as an example. I love you, but I want to see other people. I love you, but I love you, but. Now, let me ask you this. How do you think Jesus must feel when we say we love him? But, mm -hmm. I love you, Lord, but, and then, uh, let's just do a test, why not? You say, G Jesus, there's no competition in my life for you. Let's do a little test, what do you say? Don't have to answer out loud or anything at all, just think, okay? What is it that you will sacrifice your money for? Don't answer out loud. What is it that you will sacrifice your money for? One of my greatest weaknesses, and I know you won't believe this, but if you've been with me any length of time, some of you have been with me 13 years, I hate to talk about and preach about money. I don't do it very often, even though it's in the pocketbook, amen? But Jesus had a lot to say about money. And we can look at all the verses, but we're not... 
But the reason he did that probably is because money is so easy to become your God. It is so easy to replace him. I mean, our government's just handing it out left and right. 600 here, 1200 here, 1400 here, zero radius mower here. I mean, he's just handing it out. Give it, give it, give it, give it. We don't have it to spend. And our kids and grandkids will spend their lifetime, maybe our great grandkids now. But how many people have you seen and read? And, Where's my check? I want my check. Where's my check? I want my stimulus. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Who's their God? Money. And even Christians can allow that to happen. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all. Not money. Yeah. The love of money. To the point that money comes, becomes more important than God. And there are a lot of people that love money more than God. They won't admit it. But whatever we will sacrifice our money for is in competition with God. That went over real well. I see all you happy, smiley faces, so let's try a second one. When you get hurt, where do you turn for comfort? The Bible says we're to cast all our cares on him, are we not? Now it's true, there's much wisdom and counsel. But it's also equally true that he died for you and I. That he knows us best. And there's no one that can comfort you in times of stress, in times of trouble, in times of whatever like God can. Amen. Because family and people like that won't always be there. But God is there 24-7. And he makes it so simple. Cast all your care on me. Give it to him. I don't care what it is. Financial problems, marital problems, uh, depression, whatever it is. Give it to him. Cast it on him. Say, here it is, Lord. Take it. It's yours. And then let it go. Forget about it. Let him handle it. Let him take care of it. That's biblical. Is it not? Amen. I mean, I'm just giving you Bible. Don't you hate when I just give you Bible? <laughs> that one went over real well, too. How about this? What is it that frustrates you the most? Now, quit looking at your husbands. What is it that frustrates you the most? The answer to the question about this is your priorities, your focus, your selfishness. What is it that frustrates you? That Whatever it is that frustrates you, that will reveal you. You think about it. That will reveal what is important to you. Because you're letting it get to you. You're letting it frustrate you. You haven't given it to God. You're dealing with it. You're frustrated. It's what affects you. It's what is important to you. Here's the thing. Uh, fans are frustrated about one thing. Followers are frustrated about something entirely different. It's your priorities. It's who you're trusting in. It's who's first in your life. What is it that excites you the most? We'll skip frustration and go to excitement. What thing is it that excites you the most? What thing is it that you just can't, I mean, you just hear it, you think about it, and man, you just get excited about it. Today, Soccer excited a whole bunch of people. Yeah, that sure did. Today, baseball excited a whole bunch of people. This morning, I dare say, on a beautiful day like this, that little white round ball and that little metal club excited a lot of people. You know why? Because that's where they were all at. Mm -hmm. They were following their God, so to speak. Whatever it was that came before God, those things excited them. Coming to church and worshiping didn't excite them. And I promise you there were some Christians in those groups or professing Christians mm -hmm. that were in those groups. Now, when I was in Colorado, the pastor there, his doctor told him he, he needed to play golf three times a week. It was healthy for his whatever he had for exercise. Nobody would play with him, so he'd come get me. While I enjoyed being out in the fresh air, hitting that little white ball and chasing it, hitting it and chasing it, it's just not really exciting. Especially the way I hit it, because when I hit it, it'd go, 
drove her into the woods. So while they're going up there on the greens putting, I'm over here trying to find my But to some, that excites them. It's more exciting than getting up going to church on Sunday morning and listening to the preacher or worshiping God. And I promise you there are some Christians that are out there as well. Fans get excited about winning. I mean, that's their thing. They get excited about winning. Win, win, win at no cost. Followers get excited about him. We get excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the last point. Your favorite point of the message tonight is this last point, I promise you. The conclusion. <laughs> the conclusion. Now, our two texts in chapter 9 and chapter 14, they are difficult texts. But they are what's at the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that gave them to us. That, that's, his, that's his call on our life. That's what is important to him. Is that we follow him. That we deny ourselves. Yeah, man, on Sunday morning, I'd love to get up and go down the lake and fish all day. But I deny myself. Take up my cross and follow him. And every one of us could put something there. Fishing, golfing, baseball, sleeping in, sitting on the porch drinking coffee, whatever. Mm -hmm. We could all put that in there and be a fan. Still be saved and on our way to heaven. Yeah. That's not what God wants. That's not what Jesus wants. Mm -hmm. He wants us to deny ourselves. Because he wants to be number one. He deserves to be number one. He purchased you. He paid the price. He has the right to be number one. Hallelujah. The problem is not him wanting to be number one. The problem is us denying ourselves mm -hmm. and taking up our cross and following him. And that's exactly what he told us to do here. He gives it to the twelve. He gives it to the multitude. It's all or nothing. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And that's what he demands. Said so in the Ten Commandments, did he not? And so tonight as we stand with our heads bowed, and our eyes closed, no one looking around. Jesus made no apologies for these two verses. He's not apologizing when he demands that we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. After all, he's the one that suffered for us at Calvary. He's the one that bled. He's the one that died for this message that we give out tonight. It's all him. And so tonight, I ask you, count the cost. Look at your life, not your neighbor's life, not your spouse's life, but look at your life. Count the cost. Christianity is not easy if we do it God's way. Christianity is not cheap. It costs the Lord Jesus Christ everything. It costs him his life. And all he's simply asking us to do is to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. That also is not cheap. You might be demoted at work. You might lose your job. You might lose some friends and neighbors, and maybe your kids or maybe even your own life. It may come to that someday. But are you wanting to be a fan? Or are you wanting to be a follower? Are you wanting to be obedient to what God told you to do or what the devil would like for you to do? And so here's the question tonight. If following Jesus cost you everything, would you do it? Now think about that before you answer. If following Jesus cost you everything, would you do it? Would it still be worth it to you? To the fan, tonight the answer would be no. I got other things I want to be doing. But to the follower, the answer would be yes. And so tonight you have to decide. Are you the fan? Or are you the follower? Are you willing at any cost to follow him and live for him and do what he wants you to do? No matter the cost, because it could cost. It will cost. Or you just want to be a fan and come in and when the game's on, enjoy it. When the game's off, do your own thing. I can't make that decision for you. I can only make it for my own life. But you have to decide if you're willing to be a fan or a follower. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? And deny yourself, or you just want to be a fan and sit in the bleachers and just look on. 
Our Father, we ask tonight that you will help us to look deep within our hearts and lives. I pray tonight, Father, if there's one watching tonight or one here that does not know you as their Savior, that the most important decision that they could make would be to repent of their sins and come and invite you into their life to be saved and to be on their way to heaven. But Father, for those of us tonight that are saved, we need to look at these two scriptures and we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you? Are we willing uh, to face the consequences and to, and to pay the cost to serve you like you've asked us to, knowing that you promised that you would bless us and take care of us and, and that we would be able to uh, have a life that is honoring to you. So I pray that you'll help us to look and to make the right decisions. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, if that wasn't enough for you tonight, come back Wednesday night. We'll go at it again. Straight out of the Bible. Amen. Amen. Be safe going home. Everybody should get home before dark. Hallelujah. Amen.